Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, all right, so as, uh, as Sam mentioned, what I want to talk uh, today about is mostly a uh, slightly different topic than some of the past webinars, focusing more on statistical aspects uh, related to study design for early phase clinical trials, which I think as many of you are, I'm sure, struggling with uh, in the process of pulling together your protocols, in a lot of ways, the de uh, determining the design and fleshing out a protocol for an early phase clinical trial is tougher than for uh, a you know a later phase trial where the question is pretty clear. There are a lot of complexities operational uh, that have to be addressed with the later phase trials, but just formulating the question uh, to make sure that you're answering an adequate question is, is somewhat difficult uh, and, and kind of honing in on particularly what to look at in the early phase uh, type of, of, uh, of space. And by what I mean, I'm going to use broad language here, like early phase or learn, because there's kind of a, a split opinion in, in the field in terms of there's tra the traditional phase one, phase two, phase three paradigm, but there's also, as, as uh, you know, adaptive designs or more innovative designs have been used, there's kind of been a movement towards more of a learn phase and a confirm phase, where a lot of those are kind of uh, morphed together. So I'll, I'll use some broad language that could kind of fit into either model. What I'm generally going to do today is first really talk about the importance of adequate study planning for early phase clinical trials. That seems almost like a no-brainer, um, but I think there are, there are some really important aspects that you have to address. And in particular, I want to spend some time discussing some of the most common uh, issues or things that come up uh, in working with investigators uh, in trying to develop uh, early phase trials. And then after that, I'll spend a lot of time in the remainder of the talk talking about several proposed designs that can be used uh, for early phase trials. Obviously, the designs are going to vary quite a bit depending upon where you are in the development process. Next slide, please. So this is just my disclosure. I have uh, nothing to disclose other than I know some really corny biostatistics jokes, but I'll save that for another time. Uh, next slide. Uh, um, so. In terms of just to, to, just to start, I, I think it's helpful to review this document that appeared. This is, I guess, almost 15 years old now. It came out in the early 2000s uh, from uh, the National Academy of Sciences. There's an executive summary on small clinical trials uh, that was published. Next slide. And in this, there were some key recommendations that, the, so this group got together, made some key recommendations for small clinical trials, which are listed here. So defining a research question, tailoring the design to answer that question, Clarifying the methods that were used when trial results are reported, uh, performing corroborative statistical analysis to make sure that the results are, are correct and um, been adequately vetted, uh, being cautious in the interpretation, so not overly interpreting results. And then obviously there was a, a, the last part was there's a need for more research on alternative designs. Uh, next slide, please. The thing that I think com becomes most crystal clear from that is those are really no different than the things that are important in large uh, phase three trials. So uh, the, the take home from this, and I think this is the part that you have to keep in the back of your mind as you're developing a protocol in an early phase trial, is that the overall, overall principles aren't any different. So you still need to, next slide, focus on the three basic requirements that are needed for any clinical trial. Does the trial examine an important research question? So what question does the trial seek to address? Then, uh, it should use rigorous methodology to answer that question while making sure that the risk to subjects are minimized. The important part of this is that the trial should be looking at a research question where at the end of the trial, you're able to answer that question one way or the other. Maybe one way keeps you on a positive path that would suggest wherever you're developing or looking at needs to continue moving down the process, or the other might mean that you've, you've kind of proven that it's not worthwhile to continue going on. What you need to avoid and this is a problem that you run into quite a bit in these early phase studies, are trials that are really just a stepping stone that aren't really rigorously set up to address an important question, because then it becomes pretty much where the interpretation of the results depends on what someone's prior expectations are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. In the early phase setting, one of the challenges with this, so we, we all recognize, I think, in general, that the requirements uh, that need to be met in order to do an early phase trial are th actually the same as those that need to be met to do a late phase trial. But because there are size limitations, so often early phase trials are not going to be as large as late phase studies. There's going to be you know, more limitations from a resource issue in terms of the availability of subjects, the time 
you know, that you want to take to, to do the study that can make it often challenging to meet these requirements. And in some ways, that's where I alluded to at the very beginning of the presentation, the design of these early phase uh, trials can be very um, problematic and challenging from, uh, you know, from a statistical design, from a protocol development standpoint. So the importance of study planning is extremely magnified in these early phase trials. It's also the case that if you're in a large confirmatory setting, you can be a little sloppy with your statistical methods and probably still okay. That is usually not the case uh, in these early phase trials because of these limitations and you often need to be as efficient as possible. Um, that's where a lot of the more novel things, and I'll allude to some of these at the end, although I won't spend a lot of time, but you know, the use of Bayesian methods, the use of adaptive designs, things that try to uh, introduce a little bit of innovation into the design to squeeze out a bit more efficiency can be really popular in this space because you're, you're needing to maximize the efficiency of every data point, which in effect is every subject that you introduce into that study and follow. Next slide, please. So a couple of things I think that are, um, as, as I've worked individually, but also through our role here at Iowa and Neuronext, we've now uh, designed a number of different phase two studies. And there are, common, there are a couple of common, th actually more than a couple, several common themes that tend to recur on a regular basis. The first here um, is one that I think has been an issue for years. Uh, and when I sat on the NINDS clinical trial study section, it was a common thing that would come through there where uh, an investigator approached, say, a phase two trial um, really for the need to get the data that are needed to do the sample size calculation for the phase three. But the phase two looked almost identical to the phase three. It was really intended just to get that information, but there was really no question to answer because the decision had already been made to go forward. So you want to avoid early phase designs that look just like an underpowered phase three study because they're not really addressing that first point that I made in the discussion of the, uh, the things that need to be accounted for. There's no rigorous question there. All you're really doing is to collect data um, there's nothing you're going to gain from this trial. You've already made the decision that you're moving forward. The other piece to that is even if you have pilot data, there's often a temptation to use the estimated effects from that pilot study to power the follow-up study. Um, the challenge with that is it's been pretty well shown that treatment effects estimated in pilot studies often tend to be overestimated. I've got a figure here that I pulled from one publication. But if you think about that, it's really because of the systematic way in which that's interpreted. So if you do a pilot study and you don't see a promising effect, you're not going to follow up on it. If you see a promising effect, you're going to follow up on it. You might see a promising effect because it is actually there, or maybe it was just random luck that you saw that positive effect. But because of your only going forward because of that positive effect, that leads to a potentially positive bias. So if you use that to power the study, the true effect, if any, for the intervention you're looking at might be lower which would imply that you're underpowered and you might not be able to replicate that result. So for that reason, what I think you often want to do is think about what's a cl clinically meaningful important effect as opposed to an estimated effect. Because also when you're using estimated effects, there's variability around those estimates. Uh, usually the confidence intervals are pretty wide, so the point estimate in and of itself does not carry as much weight as we often try to put into it. The other common thing I see, and this, this is a bit of a challenge because usually when we're in this early phase space, it's not clear what direction to go. Maybe we've got something that we think has an impact on some broad aspect of the disease we're studying, but exactly where that uh, effect might be is a bit more hard to pin down. And so for this, one of the temptations is, well, there's actually competing demands here. On one hand, you don't want to miss a promising effect because you didn't look at a wide enough um, aspect of, of uh, outcomes to catch it. At the same time, if you look at everything, you're likely to find something regardless of whether there actually is an effect there or not. So you want to be careful, and there's often a temptation to look at a large number of efficacy endpoints. And I've seen a number of different proposals where an investigator came and they said, we're not sure what the effect of this intervention might be. Um, it could be one of perhaps you know, eight to 10 different things. I want to test each of them. And if I see uh, you know, a significant or a positive effect on any of them, I want to go forward with testing this. It's pretty easy to show, you know, just from a statistical simulation study, if you have a situation where, say, none of the outcomes show an effect and you test that large number and your, you know, your threshold for moving forward is, you know, positive effects in particular or even statistically significant effects, you're likely to hit one just by random chance. So you're almost stacking the odds in the favor that you're going to go uh, regardless of whether or not you have a positive outcome. Now, 
on one hand, from a, if, if you're, you know, a company or an investigator and you're looking to come up with something positive for patients, there's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You're going to maximize your chances of finding something. Uh, if it doesn't work, you'll tease that out in phase three and it, and it would fail. But from a, you know, from a taxpayer standpoint, for instance, if this is an IH funded, that is a problem because if you're learning that things don't work in phase three as opposed to the early phase studies, that's much more costly, much more time consuming, um, has much more implication on the field. I also think from the patient perspective, uh, it's somewhat more worrisome because I think the patient communities know that something is moving into confirmatory testing. And in general, I think they really get their hopes up. And when it fails, uh, they're, you know, they're a bit crushed and it kind of resets everything back to the very beginning. So avoiding situations where, so in, our, in this situation, you're addressing a rigorous question, but you're looking at 10 of them. So in some ways, you're not really answering any question of whether the intervention works. If you're gonna move forward, almost regardless of what comes from the study, you've already made your, your decision up that you're going forward and you're really just looking for um, information that can help you pick the endpoint to look at for that. That's really not as rigorous as you would like it to be at these uh, in these early phase trials. Ne uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other challenge is when there's budgetary limitations or limitations on how many subjects you can recruit. And so you come to the statistician and say, uh, you know, I, I want to do this study. What's my what's my sample size? Can you justify it? I can't do more than say 50 subjects. There, it's a little challenging. There may be situations where you can show that you have sufficient power with that. There may be situations where you can't. And if you're not, if you're potentially underpowered, then you may or may not be able to answer the question of interest. In that case, um, you know, you're really starting to look for trends. And trends and data are very uh, difficult to tease out And that different people can look at the same trend and come up with a completely different story. So if someone is convinced that the intervention works, they can look at a set of data and see a complete story for why that data supports the hypothesis that the intervention works. Uh, someone else could look at the same data and who thinks that the intervention doesn't work and come up with an equally as compelling story for why that, di that didn't work. And researchers are really, really good at that. We can explain anything after we see the data. Uh, one of the best stories I ever heard about this was uh, one of my former colleagues uh, when I was at UAB was at a conference where there was a clinical trial that had failed. They had done a post hoc subgroup analysis and found that the, the drug they were studying perhaps worked uh, in males but not in females. The investigator gave this, uh, you know, it made biological sense because of this, you know, went through a whole story in terms of why that made sense. And afterwards, someone asked him, well, what would you have said if the subgroup analysis had shown that it worked in females and not males? And he said, oh, I would have said, well, that makes perfect sense because it went through a perfect biological explanation of why it would work in females and not males. That's an extreme situation, but it's something I think that we're very good at. We can come up with explanations after the fact in terms of why we found things. The problem with that is then it may not replicate uh, because it was based on a trend and maybe we're over interpreting things based upon our own individual biases or our own desires to try to produce positive treatments to help patients. Next slide, please. Uh, the final thing I'll talk about with is is, and this is, this is a, a, a tricky one as well, because of the implication, or again, for the same uh, desire to, uh, to help uh, our patients, early phase studies with positive findings are more likely to be highlighted. And, and this kind of gets back to the, the effect size issue. If something is positive, whether it's real or due to chance, we get more excited about it than if something doesn't look as promising. And so we're tempted to emphasize those things that are positive, which almost by definition means they're probably in truth not as positive as we make them out to be. Where this really gets to be a problem is if you did a, a study and say you looked at 10 endpoints and you found a significant finding on one endpoint, and if that's reported when you write the paper, the paper doesn't say, I looked at 10 things and found this. It just says, hey, we looked at this one thing, found a positive result. We would like to follow that up. Those are two different things. If you're looking at a number of different things and find that, that's not as strong a level of evidence than if you knew you were focusing on this specific outcome from the very beginning of the study and found a significant result. And so the, uh, you know, how convincing that next study would need to be to confirm that would really vary based on those two situations. So the general context of, of where things stand, I think always has to be kept in the back of your mind as you're interpreting results from these types of early phase studies. Uh, next slide, please. So a good example of, of a situation where um, things can get, where you run into challenges with these types of studies. Uh, a good example is in ALS. Uh, so there was, in 2007, there was a small trial published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences 
uh, so very small, 16 treated patients, 28 uh, placebo. It, um, it, they weren't randomly assigned. It's not really clear why there was an imbalance in the two groups, but this study found a statistically significant difference in several key measures uh, for progression, survival, vital capacity, ALS, FRS, muscle strength. There's a plot you can see at the right -hand, lower right-hand corner of this slide showing the, uh, the difference in progression of ALS, FRS, R. As many of you know, ALS patients are kind of desperate for, for treatment. So when this came out, the message boards lit up. Um, everyone was trying to get lithium, which is you know something that with some effort could be uh, obtained. The challenge here is when you look at the rigor of this, there are a lot of question marks with the trial. Uh, next slide, please. So NIH actually worked um, with investigators to put together a double-blind study, like a rigorous double-blind study, to try to see whether that robust effect from the Italian study could be confirmed. And so there was 250 subjects randomized one to one, uh, doing an interim analysis after 84 subjects with a with a futility pre-specified stopping rule. If you could show uh, that that didn't um, that the effect of the Italian study could not be replicated, and in fact that's what happened uh, in that situation. And then there were three subsequent studies that also showed no effect. But the point of this is it, it's it's our general tendency that no matter how small the data. Um, if we see a positive effect, we tend to get way more excited about it than we would if it was a negative effect because we want to. It's just our nature. We want to, uh, we want to help uh, people. And so if we see that, we get excited. But we also have to keep in mind that uh, it needs to be confirmed. As a statistician, um, in some ways, I don't care how large the study is or how robust the effect looks until you show it to me twice. Uh, I tend to not believe it. Uh, when you can replicate, so you find, if you find something, you run a study and you replicate it, then you then you've convinced me but there have been so many things over the years where there's a really promising effect something that looks really great in one study and then when our study was done to replicate it it can't come close to replicating it for a variety of reasons uh, but i think you you have to be a little more skeptical i think by nature we probably approach uh the development phase the opposite the way we should i think we tend to get more excited and we tend to overemphasize the positive Whereas if we really want to minimize getting to the end and failing, we would want to be much more skeptical early on and really look at, so if a, if a study finds a positive effect early on, really look at how you might pick apart that finding and think of, well, why might this be a chance finding? What has not been addressed and really make sure that you've ironed out all of those different areas before you get into the confirmatory testing. The challenge there is there's also usually uh, a competing demand that we want to have speed. If something works, we don't want it to be tied down in, in uh, development any longer than we need to. So you've got these competing things that you have to weigh carefully uh, to avoid things that don't work moving forward too much and failing late, as opposed to things that do work, you want to move them through as quickly as possible. Uh, again, these are all things that I don't think there's a right answer to, but uh, situations for why it is so challenging to come up with designs in these early phase types of clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I've already addressed this. So next slide. I'll go on. To, so what I want to talk about for the remainder of this webinar or just give you the quick high level. So there's not really time in a one hour webinar to discuss each of these in a lot of depth, uh, but to talk about some of the designs of interest in early phase clinical trials or things that I've seen uh, pop up in early phase trials. Next slide. So I want to start with a couple of, of, of designs that are used in really early phase uh, design. So this is where you're in kind of the, the earliest uh, dose finding situation. So in, with neurological diseases, uh, if you have something that you think is potentially toxic, one of the earliest studies might be to just find what's the maximum tolerated dose. Where the maximum tolerated dose here is just defined to be the highest dose of a drug that you can give before some percent of treated patients experience what we call an unacceptable dose limiting toxicity. And that would be defined in advance uh, in the protocol. And so what you're really looking for here is how high can you go in the dose range before you start to see really bad things happen to enough of your subjects that you would probably not be able to treat at that high a level in a, in a broad study. And usually we're interested in toxicity limits of 10% to 40%. It will depend a lot on the disease, the drug, and what type of dose limiting toxicity is and what the implications of having that toxicity are. Next slide. Determining this MTD, MTD is pretty critical because that then determines your space to think of dosing in terms of your, your future study. So there's usually an assumption, it's not always true, but usually we assume that there's a monotonic relationship between efficacy and toxicity. The more toxicity, the more efficacy we're potentially going to observe. 
So what you would generally want to do here is find out how high can you go in terms of a safety standpoint, what's your maximum tolerated dose. And then you'd want to treat somewhere around that maximum tolerated dose with the idea that that's going to give you the highest chance of seeing efficacy. If you've done a poor job in your dose finding study, so let's say that what you estimate to be the maximum tolerated dose is not near your true maximum tolerated dose, which you won't know, then you have potential problems. If your dose is too low, then you might have a potentially useful drug, but you're not going to see efficacy in your follow-up studies because you're too low in the dose range to see efficacy. You didn't go as high as you perhaps could have if you'd done a better job. Uh, the alternative, which in some ways is more of a concern, if you go too high, so you've chosen too toxic a dose as the MTD because your technique overshot, you're going to put potential subjects in future studies at risk and you're going to see a lot of safety concerns, which again would have the same potential consequence that a potentially useful drug might be missed because you thought there was a safety concern where the safety concern was only because you were dosing too high in the potential ranges. Next slide. The most well-known approach for doing this is what's known as the 3 plus 3. I think many of you are probably familiar with this. It's a popular design uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it's relatively straightforward. Um, you don't really need a statistician on board to implement. It's pretty intuitive. You just treat three subjects at a dose. Depending on whether you have 0, 1, 2, or 3, who have a DLT determines how you progress up in the paradigm. And you can see kind of the schematic of how it flows here. Because of that, it, it's really popular. This is developed out of oncology. Uh, used a lot there. It's kind of bled over into neurology uh, in the last probably 10 or 15 years. Uh, next slide, please. The challenge uh, with, with this, so the strengths are the ones I mentioned. It's simple, it's intuitive, you don't really need a, a statistician. But it's been criticized for treating patients at low ineffective doses and it also doesn't do a really good job of estimating the MTD in some situations. So as I mentioned, this was developed in oncology uh, and it was really developed in situations, and you think about the um, where the three comes from is it was kind of um, targeted for situations where the dose limiting toxicity might occur in a range of about 30 to 35 percent. So you think, you know, if about a third of the patients you treat have the dose limiting toxicity, that's your threshold. Uh, if that's the situation, this technique works pretty well. In a lot of neurological settings where you're using this, that might not fit as well. For instance, um, this has been used, uh, dose findings become popular in stroke studies where maybe you've got uh, uh, an agent that you think might treat acute stroke, and there the dose limiting toxicity might be something like like major bleeding. But if major bleeding is your dose limiting toxicity, you're not necessarily going to uh, accept a third of your patients have a major bleed. Maybe the dose limiting toxicity there might be more in the 10% range. If it's in the 10% range, then it's pretty easy to show if you use the rule from the 3 plus 3, you're going to overshoot the MTD. Because it's based on stopping if you have one or two, you know, so if you have patients with dose limiting toxicities. If your underlying rate of a DLT is only 10%, out of three subjects, you're unlikely to see any with it. So you're going to keep moving up, and, and most likely, you're going to estimate a dose to be your MTD that is higher than your actual dose associated with the 10% dose limiting toxicity level. Uh, next slide, please. That has led to what has become... Uh, more of the standard approach in recent years is uses of adaptive dose finding techniques such as the continual reassessment method, which is definitely the most popular. Uh, I, I put a reference in here, uh, it's a tutorial from Statistics and Medicine 2006. If you're interested in more, it's a, it's a great tutorial written kind of in a non-statistical level to really give more background of the CRM. It's a Bayesian method uh, that came out of phase one cancer trials that now has been used uh, in a number of different neurological settings. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea of how the CRM works is if you basically you start uh, with some assumed a priori dose toxicity curve and based on that curve you've specified your chosen target toxicity rate. So what's the maximum level of toxicity that you're willing to accept? And doing that you assign the first subjects to the doses most likely to be associated with the target toxicity level. What I'm, what I'm referring to here is how the CRM was originally um, proposed. You then treat that subject, see whether or not they have a DLT and then refit the curve. So you get a posterior distribution in statistical terms of the curve that incorporates both your prior assumptions, so the, the assumed uh, dose toxicity curve that you started with, and the outcome in the subjects or number of subjects that you've treated to date to get a refit curve. So obviously if the first subject has a DLT, it's going to shift the curve, the numbers are going to go up, you're going to estimate higher toxicity at each of the doses and you're going to go down in terms of where you might think the dose that corresponds to the DLT is. If that subject does not have a DLT, 
it's going to pull the curve down and you're potentially going to be able to go at a higher dose at maintaining the same level of DLTs. So you refit that after each time you assign the next subject based on uh, the dose that uh, was assumed based on that refit dose toxicity curve and you just continue this process until you beat some predefined stopping criteria. Uh, next slide please. So here, if, if, you, if just an example, I always think this is easier to kind of explain um, pictorially as opposed to verbally. So if, if this, let's say you're in a situation and here, uh, let's say this is a drug you can infuse. And so you have, um, you know, doses ranging ranging from zero to 20. So a dose of zero, one, two, three, four, five for, um, for argument's sake. And your target level of toxicity is 10%. If the curve that you see here represents what we believe is the dose toxicity curve at the start of the study, if 10% is our target toxicity level, you would trace over on the curve that comes down to a dose of about five. So that would tell us that dose level five would be the optimal starting dose. That's the dose that based on our prior expectations is at our target level of dose limiting toxicity of 10%. Uh, next slide, please. If you then uh, go through the next um, several slides, this, so the animation doesn't work in this, but this is an example of what might happen. So each of the data points here um, shows, oops, shows a subject um, who was treated. So the ones on the bottom are subjects who were treated and did not have toxicities. Subjects on the top are subjects who were treated and did have toxicities. And what you can see there is how the curve changes over time. So the one in purple at the bottom, that would be the first subject that we treat. We treated them at our dose level of five and they did not have a toxicity. So because they didn't have a toxicity, we refit the curve. Now we're early in the process, so, our, our, it, so that first subject is going to have a lot of impact on the curve. When we refit the curve, we get the, ver the blue curve that you see kind of at the very bottom of the set of figures. Based on that curve, if we trace over our 10% toxicity level, that comes down to a dose of about 12. When we treat a subject with that dose, that's the blue dot at the top, we had a toxicity, that's going to pull the curve back and then you can see at that point it kind of reiterates around the same range until at the very end, on our final curve, once we've iterated through the process, we hit a target dose somewhere between seven and eight, which would be our final estimate of the maximum tolerated dose. Next slide, please. So the strengths of the CRM, one of the advantages of this is that it learns from information gained at early time points in the study. It uses all the data. So the three plus three design, the rule is based only on what happened to the three subjects at the dose that was currently under consideration. The CRM uses the data as it accumulates. So it's based on your prior assumptions and all of the data that is, has accrued so far. So if you're at a particular dose, the refitting of the dose toxicity curve takes into account what happens to the subjects that you're treating at that particular dose, as well as the subjects that you treated with all particular doses that happened before that and your prior assumptions. So you're continually adding to your information, but accounting to everything that you know as you go forward. It's also been shown to generally be more efficient and safer than the three plus three design, so it's more accurate. Uh, for correctly estimating the MTD. It's more likely to treat uh, participants at doses around the MTD and it's less likely to stay a long time at, at ineffective doses. So in general, this gets quickly into the range of the, M of the MTD. You may um, move around that range until you iterate to the, the value, but you're gonna spend more time in the general target range around that MTD than outside. If you take our prior example and you look at how that curve iterated, uh, you spend more time in that range between say five and eight than you do outside of there. What that means is at the end when you're estimating the dose toxicity curve, you're gonna have tighter estimates in that range and wider estimates around the curve at the others. But that's actually a good thing because that's the range you're probably more interested in when you start to consider, consider your data and how it might impact your future trials. Next slide please. Now there are some concerns with the CRM at least as it was originally proposed. And the example that I presented is really a good example of that. Particularly, there's a safety concern. So in that situation, remember, we started with a dose of five. Because that first subject did not have a toxicity, it made a big difference and shifted the curve down, which we would then estimate the, the dose to be 12. That would meet our threshold of 10% dose limiting toxicity. Not surprisingly, that person had a toxicity. That is a bit of a concern of whether you would want to jump that high up in your dosing range based on such little data. So for this reason, what is actually used in practice now is what is more of a modified CRM that works slightly different. It's not quite as efficient as what was originally proposed, but protects subjects more from a safety standpoint. And so what is usually done now is you would always start patients at the lowest dose under consideration, regardless of what your a priori belief of the dose toxicity curve was. 
we would enroll two to three patients in each cohort. It's usually we enroll three patients in a cohort. And at any given dose escalation, you can't increase by more than one level. What that really kind of does is in some ways what's done now, although I don't know if it's necessarily called as such, it's almost like a morphing between the three plus three and the CRM. We tend to start at the lowest level, treating cohorts of three. As long as we don't see any DLTs, we're going to keep moving up, and it's basically the same you would move up if you were doing the three plus three design. But once we observe our first dose limiting toxicity, then we kind of deviate from what you would do in a three plus three design and use the model based approach from the CRM to determine how to treat future cohorts of subjects. Uh, next slide, please. So, some other uh, designs, and this really gets more into uh, analysis type methods that can be done in early phase studies, back to the point that I made early on about you want to squeeze out as much efficiency as possible. So uh, for one good example of that is a repeated measures design. So this is a design where maybe you're getting multiple observations on individuals. So say it's a 24-week study and you're going to measure subjects every four weeks. A lot of times uh, we might do that in a phase three trial and our primary outcome would be change from baseline. So the change in the score from baseline to 24 weeks, say. And a lot of times when we analyze that, we don't really account for the data points that we, we collected in between. In doing so, we're losing a little bit of efficiency because we can, we can estimate the correlation better. We can look at trends by modeling of the data over time. Uh, and ignoring that, a lot of times, although we're losing some statistical efficiency, it's often uh, we're not that concerned about it in large studies. In these early phase trials, that might be a bigger concern. With the, if we can account for the longitudinal nature of the study, maybe we can account for the correlation to reduce our variability somewhat, which is going to increase our power, which is going to allow us to use a smaller sample size, which might be critical in these types of early phase trial uh, uh, design examples. Next slide, please. So just some examples, if you're measuring over time, often the standard we have is just do we take the final value minus the baseline, so the change from baseline. A better approach, and this is often done in larger studies, is um, we take the final value with the baseline value as a covariate, or we adjust for the baseline value as a covariate. Uh, next, uh, next slide. What's even better is if we uh, do more of a longitudinal modeling of the data as a whole, and then try to do comparisons of how the curves change. We do this some in early phase studies, where perhaps we do a comparison of slopes over time, if we can assume that there's some you know, linear progression over time. Uh, if it's not linear, then it's a little more complicated, but we can still do that in order to, in, in other words, instead of comparing two groups at one particular point in time, we compare their trends over time to really see are they changing, uh, is there a difference, is the, is the intervention either increasing if it's a positive or is it slowing into, if it's some kind of progression in point. Uh, next slide, please. Another option um, which is somewhat popular uh, in early phase studies but can also be problematic is crossover design. So this is one that I think has a lot of appeal initially, that once you get into the weeds, it can sometimes be a little difficult to address. And the idea of a crossover design is each subject acts as their own control. So you, you can often reduce your sample size because you don't have an independent control group and treated group. It's also popular from a patient advocacy standpoint because everyone who enrolls in the study is going to get drug and placebo at some point. So you don't have people who are enrolling who are only getting the placebo. Um, you can reduce the sample size. Uh, next slide, please. All you're really doing is changing the order that they get them. The disadvantages that you have here, and this is where, uh, this is where you get lost in the weeds often uh, and get stuck when you're trying to incorporate this. The disease needs to be long-term. You have to, um, and the big assumption is that, let's say you start on treatment, and maybe there's some improvement due to treatment, but when you withdraw treatment, if you don't go back to the level that you were before treatment, you have what's known as a carryover effect. And a carryover effect can be problematic in these types of crossover designs because the people who were treated first, by the time they start treating with placebo, they're going to be better because there's some carryover effect from the fact they were treated first, whereas the people who are treated second are going to be still at their, base, at their baseline threshold level of the outcome that you're looking at. So the ordering is then going to make a difference in terms of the size of effect that you're seeing in the placebo group, which will affect the drug placebo comparisons. There are, there are statistical methods that can try to address for carryover effect. It's a very challenging problem to do. So if there's thought, particularly if there's a big carryover effect, these can be problematic designs to do. So it's really a situation where it sounds great because it's a way to reduce sample size, but you have to step back and think in the situation that I'm working in, is this appropriate? Do I have a carryover effect? There are some disease areas where you can make strong cases that there aren't carryover effects in those, in those disease areas. 
crossover designs are perfectly suitable for early phase designs and can reduce the sample size requirements. There are other areas where this is probably not feasible because once you maybe treat someone, you improve, maybe they worsen after you withdraw treatment, but they don't go back to their original baseline level. And so there's going to be some carryover effect that you would have to address uh, in the analysis phase. Next slide, please. Uh, another uh, technique uh, that has received some attention lately, uh, it, particularly this is uh, of interest if you're in a really rare disease, is an N of 1 design. An N of 1 design is, is really a special case of a crossover design where instead of, you know, you treat once on placebo, once on treatment, you have a group, you have a subject and you treat them multiple times. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there was a good example in clinical trials uh, a few years ago. You could do this, say, in an asthma study. You're looking for um, something to treat when you're having an asthma attack. And so you might randomize the subject so that at certain times they're getting the active uh, inhaler, other times they're getting the control inhaler, and you do that multiple times, and then you're able to compare how they're doing on the times they're on treatment versus when they're off treatment. Right, in that case, you wouldn't really worry about a carryover effect because each one is different. Uh, the intensity may vary over time, but if you're doing enough of them within a subject, uh, they're going to be balanced over the different course of the subjects. And you're randomizing the order of treatment, so you wouldn't want to do it where they always get uh, treatment, then placebo, then treatment, then placebo. You're going to, you're going to want to randomize it within each pair or within blocks of four or so. Next slide. Um, so you can do that on a single subject to try to get a sense of that. You can also uh, combine, if you do multiple N of 1 studies, then they can be combined using meta-analysis. Um, it's something that's been used some, uh, not a lot, but I, I think uh, it's, it's starting to get more attention in recent years. And I think particularly with the challenges in rare diseases, it's something that we might see more of uh, in the near future. Uh, next slide, please. Another design I think that's helpful uh, in early phase studies, particularly when it's uncertain where you should go in terms of a phase three study, is what's known as a selection design. So selection designs are very different from the designs that we generally think of. So the question really here is not looking for proof of concept of a single drug. Selection designs might be appropriate where, let's say that you're in a disease area and there's several treatments that are showing promise. You would like to take one into perhaps a phase three study, but you're not clear which one to go. Um, if you looked at each one individually in a proof of concept study, you're going to need a pretty sufficient sample size because you're going to need sample size to power each of those individually. A way to get around that in a selection design is perhaps, let's say you had five different treatments to look at. You put them in a selection design, and the selection design chooses the one that looks to be the most promising. It's often described as a horse race. You're just putting the treatments in, and whichever one looks best on your endpoint doesn't necessarily have to be statistically significant would be selected and moved into further testing. Uh, next slide, please. So anyway, the, the, with the selection di designs, the challenge of that is you're trying to pick one out of many. They have a high type 1 error, right? So if, let's say you have two treatments, you're choosing the best out of that. If neither of them work, your type 1 error is still high because you're going to pick one regardless. But it can be a way to winnow things out. It also works well if you're doing kind of a two-phase type setting. So perhaps. Uh, in the situation I mentioned before where you have five treatments you want to consider, maybe you do a selection design as the first phase and choose one of the five to focus on then and a proof of concept in more of a traditional phase two type design to see whether you have enough evidence of efficacy to justify taking that treatment forward in a phase three design. Another design that's worth mentioning um, that has been used in a number of different neurological settings is the futility design. The futility design, I, I, I think the name kind of sours people on it because it sounds kind of negative in nature, but it actually can be a pretty promising design uh, that can be used. And really, this design gets at the situation where we need data to help plan the phase three trial, um, but we can't really power our phase two study uh, to show efficacy in the same way we would for phase three. And if we don't power for efficacy, we potentially have an underpowered phase three study. This is more of a screening tool that uh, if you're familiar with uh, non-inferiority designs that are used in drug research, you can think of this as a non-superiority study. So what you're really trying to see here is you're trying to do a phase two study to get preliminary information, but also to see it, can you collect enough evidence to rule out what you determine is a clinically meaningful effect. You're not trying to show that there is a clinically meaningful effect. You're trying to rule it out. So your null and your alternative hypothesis are flipped here. Your null hypothesis would be that you do have a clinically meaningful effect. Your alternative hypothesis would be that you don't have a clinically meaningful effect. 
So rejecting the null hypothesis would be declaring futility. And declaring futility means the results of why it's not cost effective to move into a phase three study because I've ruled out what I deem to be the clinically meaningful effect that I would use to power that phase three study. If I don't reject the null hypothesis, it means I haven't declared futility. I haven't proven efficacy though, because remember, failing to reject the null hypothesis does not prove the null hypothesis. That's saying though I can't I can't rule it out. And that would be justification for moving forward into a larger phase three study, which would then be used to rule out whether that effect is true, or maybe there is no effect, it's just not far enough away from the effect for me to declare futility. So it's kind of a screening tool. Um, when this was first uh, introduced as a concept, Yuko Palish and some of her colleagues at MUSC looked at a number of different stroke studies that had built in phase three, and they showed that in a relatively high percentage of those, if you had applied a futility design in phase two, you could have declared futility at that point and not gone into the complexity and cost of a phase three. So it's something that I think can be useful in the kind of the phase two proof of concept setting to see whether you know, whether you can rule that out. If you can rule that out at this point, it's not worth the added effort and expenditures that would be required to go into phase three testing. Uh, next slide, please. So just as an example of how uh, the, I mentioned the null and alternative hypothesis, how you lay those out. Suppose that we have a situation where a 10% increase uh, in, in favorable response rates for a treatment we're studying over placebo would be meaningful. The null hypothesis of the futility design here would be that the treatment improves outcome by at least 10%. The alternative would be that it does not improve outcome by at least 10%. So you can see the way it's laid out here. On the go, uh, next slide, please. On the next slide, there's a table that kind of shows from the usual design where we're generally testing for efficacy, where our null hypothesis is they're the same and our alternative is they're different, how the various concepts are different in a futility design with respect to what it means if you reject the null hypothesis what a type 1 and type 2 error are. So a type 1 error here would be that we um, reject the null hypothesis when we don't. Rejecting means we declare in futility. So a type 1 error means that we have an effective therapy that we incorrectly declared futile. We would want to avoid that and we would want to choose our alpha level for the test of futility in such a way to minimize that probability. A type 2 error here would be determined that an ineffective therapy is not futile. So if we have a, a, a therapy that is futile, that can be ruled out in phase three. The implications of that depends on the cost of it and complexity of the phase three trial. Uh, next slide, please. Because of these properties in general, futility designs are powered and such to have high negative predictive values. So if we declare futility, the treatment is likely not effective with high probability. What they don't have is high positive predictive values. They tend to have low positive predictive values, which means the lack of futility does not imply treatment is effective. Again, this is for the same uh, uh, reason that I mentioned before. Failure to reject a null hypothesis does not prove uh, the null hypothesis. So the futility designs are appropriate as a screening tool when you really want to uh, determine whether uh, you know the error of failing to go to phase three is more serious than going to phase three with an ineffective treatment. But nevertheless, they are an improvement over running underpowered efficacy trials. And they are a way to get the rigor that I mentioned at the very beginning of the study into a phase two trial, even when uh, another maybe secondary objective is you need to get preliminary data that you can use to power the future phase two trial. Next slide, please. The last thing I want to talk about is really quickly just a brief uh, discussion of adaptive designs, because this, I think, uh, in early phase uh, trials are being used a lot. The F an FDA guidance came out in 2010 that really focused mostly on f adaptive designs in phase three, but they did make the point in the guidance document that um, it was encouraged to use adaptive designs in earlier phase settings and, and correspondingly there's been a real uptick in their use. Uh, the whole idea here is based on there's a need for more efficient clinical trial design which we've discussed in this webinar uh, quite a bit. Uh, there's also an interest in innovative trial designs. What adaptive designs allow us to do is to review accumulated information uh, so that we can modify trial characteristics. The traditional way that designs are, are put together is we make some assumptions at the beginning we design our trial based on those assumptions, and then we carry the trial out, analyze our data, and if it turns out that we were incorrect, well, if we were incorrect, we try to learn from that and proceed to do better the next time. Adaptive designs try to push that process earlier. So if it becomes clear after we started a trial that some of our assumptions were incorrect, adaptive designs give us an option to perhaps make changes to the design while it's ongoing in a way that can correct for those, uh, those misspecified assumptions early on and still get good properties at the end. Uh, next slide, please. 
there are a couple of definitions of adaptive designs. I think there's important components of both of these. So there was a, a paper from an adaptive designs working group that was originally sponsored by Pharma and then moved to the Drug Information Association several years ago. Also, there was a definition of the FDA draft guidance. Both of these, which you see in the slide, go to the uh, next slide, please. Uh, both of these focus on one key aspect of adaptive designs, and that, th that is this concept of adaptive by design. So what this means is the adaptations have to be planned. So when you're setting up an adaptive design, you typically know there's uncertainty in some of the decisions that you're making, and you want to get information in the study to uh, get a better handle on that uncertainty. And you set it up in such a way that as you get the information, your decisions are kind of specified. So if A happens, I will do this. If B happens, I will do this. If C happens, I will do that. The reason that's important is if you're adapting based on data, as true with any data-driven type analysis, you run the potential of introducing bias into your results, either through a biased parameter estimates, inflated type 1 error rate. There are a number of ways that you can introduce mathematical bias. The only way that you can really assess that and rule that that's not a problem is to do simulation studies under a wide range of scenarios. In order to do those simulation studies, you have to know what your adaptations are going to be under a wide range of scenarios. And the only way you can do that is if you specified in advance what you're going to do. So the only planned adaptations that can be guaranteed to avoid unknown bias are those that are specified in advance and can be conducted through simulation studies. If you decide to make a change in a trial halfway through, you can conditionally look at the con you know, impact on type 1 error, but you can't unconditionally roll out any type of bias because you can't say what you would have done if something different had happened before you made the decision to adapt the trial. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you've got, I, I put this in here, uh, this is just real, really more for reference, just to show there's a wide number of different types of adaptive designs, and, and in fact, there's an infinite number of adaptive designs. These are just some of the more common. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a common one, I mean, actually, most of you have probably encountered adaptive designs, whether you think you have or not, because group sequential designs or the interim monitoring that we do with O'Brien Fleming and land demands type spinning functions in, in clinical trials are actually fit under the definition of an adaptive design. Uh, next slide. The last thing I want to talk about with adaptive designs, so I think this is important as people get excited about using them in early phase trials, or particularly, like as I mentioned, a similar with the end of one, adaptive designs are popular in kind of the rare disease setting because of the efficiency they can bring in. It is important to keep in mind, though, that the design can't change the answer to the question you're addressing. What an adaptive design, adaptive design can do is to enable you to perhaps more efficiently answer the question. But I, I've seen this when adaptive designs are presented. Often there's a misperception that this is the design that's going to finally bring an effective treatment to a disease area that has maybe had none. The design can't do that. Uh, the treatment has to work or not work in a, on its own. Uh, the adaptive design is not going to address that. I think they're also often presented as a way that it can get uh, you know effective drugs to market quicker. And that there's some truth to that. They can be more efficient in, in moving through. In, in practice, though, what I've seen mostly and what I think is probably the biggest advantage of adaptive designs is they can identify ineffective treatments much quicker and much more efficiently. So in terms of, uh, you know, trying to rule out things that maybe don't work, adaptive designs can do that more efficiently. Now, that's a problem given the way we, you know, we, we're convinced things work and we really want to hold on that belief until we can't anymore. But maybe the adaptive designs give us the evidence to really change our mindset so that we don't get into the large, expensive phase threes. Uh, we can roll out that it's ineffective. That's good. Uh, it's, it's bad in the sense of the individual study, but it's good for the disease area in a broad sense because then we can reallocate the resources to potentially other interventions or treatments that might work instead of spending more time in an area, spending more of our resources before we find out that it does not work. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, to summarize in general, uh, every trial needs to have an appropriate study design. It needs to have sufficient sample size, adequate power, proper control of bias with the goal of answering the question of interest, right? So there should always be, this is the question I want to address in this trial. I've set up my design. I've set up my characteristics in such a way that I have high probability of answering the question. And one of the things I'll say is often you hear the term negative clinical trials. A clinical trial was negative, uh, uh, used in a situation where, you know, the treatment didn't work. Um, I would argue that's probably poor notation. If the treatment truly didn't work and the trial ruled that it didn't, the trial was positive, right? It was negative in the sense that the intervention uh, is not positive, but the trial was positive. If the trial answered the question, whether it shows that the treatment worked or it shows that the treatment 
did not work to the level that would be needed to you know, perhaps move forward with it. The trial was positive. Uh, and so I think we have to think of it that way, uh, that, that what we want to do is set up the study so that we can answer that question one way or the other. The worst situation is when perhaps we're underpowered and we're not able to answer the question. In that situation, if we don't get a significant result, we don't know if it's because the treatment didn't work or because the treatment worked, we just weren't adequately powered to show that it worked. And that could be the worst situation because an effective treatment, maybe it's, an, it's interpreted as negative when it was actually underpowered and it might be you know, put on a shelf or the whole line of study stops because of this misperception it was negative when in fact maybe if the study had been adequately powered it would have worked and that could have negative consequences in the disease area as well. So that's the conclusion. There was a lot of material in here. Um, you know, at the course, uh, in a few weeks, there'll be additional uh, discussion of early phase designs, a little more in-depth discussion of some of these areas, uh, and lots of, and depending on your specific uh, proposals, you may have questions about one or more of these different areas. So I'd be glad to answer questions here, or if things come up after uh, the webinar or at the course uh, in Michigan, be glad to try to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Coffey. There's a question from Michael Rosenblum in the chat box. Um, can you discuss more about the simulations that go with adaptive design? Is there a particular software or statistical method associated with these simulations? Yeah, so there, um, there's not kind of a particular simulation. There's, se there's several different approaches that are out there. I mean, it's, it's really an area, I think, where people are trying to develop software to make that easier. In terms of the particular method, the methods for the simulation should match the methods for the trial. So whatever, in essence, what you're doing is you're, you know, the simulation is basically it's running, um, it's, it's running, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, pretend clinical trials over and over under some assumptions, right? So maybe we, if we think a treatment works, we run a scenario under a situation where the treatment works to the level we think it does. Maybe we run another scenario where we, we, the treatment works half as well as we think it uh, does, another one where it doesn't work at all. And we run, you know, fake clinical trials, simulating data, analyze the way that we're going to analyze the trial at the end to look at, you know, what do we see, uh, an estimate that's representative of what we thought, what's our type 1 error, and, and so forth. So it really should mirror the trial that you're going to do. Part of the problem of putting it together a simulation study is in a lot of ways as complex as a clinical trial and that you almost need a protocol lay out the conditions you're going to look at, what are the scenarios you want to consider. What you want to avoid in a simulation is just, is you might think this is a situation where I think my drug is going to work to this level, so I simulate it under this and I show that it works really well in that scenario. That's not sufficient. You also need to consider how it works in other situations. What if what you expect to happen doesn't happen? Are there any unforeseen negative consequences there? So it, it's a complex issue. I think in the advanced track of the course, there'll be a lot of discussion of that because that's an important uh, aspect of adaptive designs. A lot of what I think those of you in the foundations track are doing probably won't be much in this adaptive framework. It's it's a bit much to to kind of chew off, uh, you know, to, to tackle for your first um, you know protocol that you're developing. But it's something that downstream in your careers you may. If you are interested, there are um, two webinars from earlier in the series that are posted on the course website um, related to adaptive designs. The first is an introduction to flexible adaptive designs, and the second is about understanding simulations. I think there's also there's a number of like overview papers that I, I, I I can't remember, Sam, do we have like a reference list? If not, I'm sure we could pull some if people are interested. There's a number of like good overview Yes, we can add those to, the, to well. the webinar list as well, webinar page. I think there's one other question from um, Heidi Schamber, but I don't see it. I see that she's typing, though. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, she provided a reference um, in Neuro. Um, so if there are no more uh, questions, um, I just wanted to close off the webinar by saying thank you again to everyone for joining us today, and um, especially thank you to uh, 
Dr. Coffey for joining us today. Um, if you're interested in CMEs, again, uh, please complete an evaluation form. Um, the link is below. Just click Browse to. Um, and the next webinar will be on July 10th at noon Eastern Time, and we'll be discussing adverse event monitoring and clinical trials. So I um, hope to see you then. Thank you, everyone.